Thank you, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. So we're getting ready to start the big book again. Uh, we, we Last week, we covered the end of the uh, forward to the second edition. The forward to the third and fourth edition are just a page long. They don't really have any great revelations of history or anything. It talks a little bit about the growth. There's the, There's more books printed. There was more languages printed, groups showed up in new countries, and and AA expanded and uh, in both the third edition and the fourth edition. So we're going to, you know, read them on your own, see, see what you can get out of that. And then the book starts with the doctor's opinion. It's before the first chapter. You know, it was a very, it's a very special part of the history of AA, and in it, the doctor did some things that, that no one else had ever done. You know, we did, nobody knew that, you know, alcoholism was looked at as you were some low moral standard person if you drank and got drunk all the time. Nobody thought there's, they didn't know anything about anything like the disease of alcoholism. It wasn't known to be a disease at the time. And then when they started looking at the disease, they found out that the drinking part of the disease this is basically an, an allergy, but it's a really weird allergy. It's not like any other allergy that exists in the world. You know, it's a different kind of allergy. But that wasn't even all of the disease. There was a second part, a mental part of the disease. So it had two separate parts. One wouldn't exist without the other. And so there had to be some thinking about how that was going to, how are we going to cure alcoholism or how are we going to treat alcoholism? They had no idea how. And so the doctor did a lot of work and he looked at a lot of drinkers. He noticed that about 90% of the people that actually drank alcohol would have one or two drinks, be happy and go home. That was it. They wouldn't drink more. If they only drank half a beer, they were happy with that. They'd go home. Yet we looked at the other 10% of people who drank and they couldn't stop drinking no matter what. They always drank too much. They never controlled their drinking. They couldn't. And then after that, after they had drank and drank and drank until they had to get sober, at least for a day or two, they'd go right back to drinking again. And so they, they looked into it, they kept looking into it, and they found out that part of alcoholism, you know, the nature of the disease, the concept of the disease was pretty complicated, and it turns out to be different. So I'm going to share uh, this particular uh, form called the, the disease concept of alcoholism. And it has, if you notice, it has um, uh, it has a physical side of it over here and it has a mental side of it. Okay. So it's true, you know, no other disease is like that. Cancer is not like that. Diabetes isn't like that. All the other diseases we get aren't like that. You know, they're not a physical and a mental part of, of most of the diseases. So uh, they, they didn't really know how to treat that. They didn't know how to deal with that. So they started looking at the part of, of the disease that's the physical part because the doctor worked in a hospital where all the drunks came to him and he treated, tried to treat the drunks. And he was drink, treating their physical part. Uh, of their disease. Um, and and the doctor decided to call it an allergy, that alcoholics have one out of every 10, okay, nine drink safely, one does not drink safely. One of them has the, the allergy. Well, it's a different allergy. If you're allergic to peanuts, or shellfish, you have a risk. The, the consequences of those allergies are life, you know, they, they risk your life. They threaten your life. 
you need to have epinephrine to recover from them. If somebody who has an allergy to a peanut eats something made of with peanut oil or some part of the peanut, they go into anaphylactic shock and they need epinephrine to save their lives. So they're very dangerous allergies. Same thing with seafood. You, you got to be treated immediately if you eat seafood and you're allergic to it. So those are, those are really bad allergies. And then we have other lesser allergies. We have allergies to, to strawberries. We have allergies to milk. You know, if you have an allergy to strawberry, you you know, and you eat a strawberry, you're not going to die, but you're going to be uncomfortable for a while. You're going to have blotches all over you. You're going to have a rash. You're going to hurt. But not going to die. So it's not that tragic, you know. And um, an allergy to milk. You know, if you eat a bowl of ice cream and you're lactose intolerant, you better stay near a bathroom. You're going to need a bathroom. So you're not going to die. You're just going to be uncomfortable. And those people can make a choice. They can, you know, you could say, boy, I know I'm going to pay for it, but I really want that, you know, hot fudge sundae. And they'll eat a hot fudge sundae and knowing full well that for the rest of the evening, they're going to be uncomfortable. But they're not going to die. So they'll risk it. You know, they have a choice. You know, they'll eat ice cream or not eat ice cream. And the same thing with strawberries. You know, if you eat strawberry shortcake, you're going to have a rash, you know, and if it's so uncomfortable, you can't stand it, you just won't eat strawberries. And if you can't take lactose intolerance, you just won't drink milk. Easy enough. You just decide easy enough not to do it. And with those allergies, you know, if you have a bowl of ice cream, you don't crave another bowl of ice cream. You already know you're going to be sick. So you're just like, that's it. I'm just going to take it. You know, those are the consequences I'm going to have to pay. And you become willing to pay. Then there's other allergies like ragweed or, you know, hay fever. You know, there's pollen everywhere. You can't stay away from pollen. We live in Florida. Something's blooming every day. There's, there's pollen in the air in Florida all the time. You cannot avoid it. You don't have a choice in the matter. You know, you can't stay away from the pollen. So we have medicine for it. We have antihistamines. Your eye, you know, the and the consequences of hay fever is eyes are red and, and tearing, your nose is stuffed up, your sore throat gets sore, and you just don't feel good. You know, but they made a pill. They made antihistamines. You take some antihistamines, your eyes dry up, you don't, you know, they're not, they don't look red, you don't get a headache, you don't have a runny nose. And you can tolerate them because there's there's a, a, a medicine for it. So in all those allergies, you have either you have a choice or you don't have a choice, you know. And in some of them, you're, a bad choice could could kill you, and other ones, a bad choice just makes you feel sick for the evening or the next day, you know. Um, and some of them, like you say, you don't have a choice; you can't avoid them, so you're going to get, you know. If, you have to take your antihistamines or suffer more. But the allergy to alcohol is entirely different. And, you know, it just works so differently in the human being. So let's look at it a little bit. In a normal drinker, and they're called normal drinkers because nine out of 10 people that drink alcohol can drink it without the allergy. They don't have the allergy. So there's no real punishment for them for drinking it. But they have one drink. The normal people. They have a drink. And that drink gets into their system and they feel good. You know, it makes them feel, you know, giddy and they laugh and all that. But if they have two, maybe, or even three, They'll start to get dizzy and wobble and they don't feel like they can drive and, you know, it starts affecting them. So they quit drinking it, but their body metabolizes it quickly. They have enzymes in their body of sufficient quality and quantity to actually digest the alcohol. And it turns into this stuff, which I can't pronounce. And then it goes down, and the next thing it turns into is this stuff. 
and then it turns into acetone. Okay, but in a normal drinker, the acetone is digested quickly. And when it's digested, it turns into three harmless things. Water, why you pee a lot when you drink. Sugar, that's why you get fat when you drink. And carbon dioxide, which causes a problem. So, um, so you know, we have to be careful, you know, but you know, they don't lose control. These people don't lose control. They're normal. They drink and they are at ease when they drink because nothing bad is going to happen to them. Once it's digested, they're back to normal. No problems. But the alcoholic, the one in 10 that have the disease of alcoholism, that have the allergy that, that produces, they're, they're allergic to alcohol. They have one drink. They drink that drink, and they have a second and a third drink, but their enzymes in their body are of insufficient quality and quantity to digest the alcohol properly. It still gets digested into these same two things here, and then into acetone. The problem is, in the normal drinker, the acetone gets quickly changed into water, sugar, and carbon dioxide. In the alcoholic, it stays as acetone longer. And you see this line here. That's when it should be gone. That's when it's acetone over here and it's gone. But it stays acetone in our body longer. So when it stays acetone, one of the qualities of acetone is that it produces a phenomenon of craving. If you have that one drink, it tells you, because of the acetone, oh, let's have another one of those. And so we have another one. Well, that makes more acetone. And we have another drink and another drink and another drink. And every time we have a drink, we end up with too much acetone in our body. And our acetone makes us have two, three, four, who knows how many drinks. And those drinks make out for what we call a well-known spree and we've all been on those we've all been on those sprees that caused us to just do dumb stuff you know and we did a lot of that dumb stuff so we have the spree now once you have that first drink there's nothing anybody can do to help you because you're going to be completely out of control at the end of the spree you know you've lost you know you're just crazy and you just can't stop drinking and you'll continue drinking until you run out of money they kick you out of the bar they close the bar or whenever you run out of alcohol and you don't have any more alcohol so all this way there's nothing much that you can do once once the allergy is in there you don't have a choice to not drink you know you have a choice not to eat any more strawberries you have a choice not to do uh drink milk or eat more ice cream. We lose our choice when we're drinking and the allergy just keeps on happening and we get more and more and more acetone and therefore we drink more. And when we finally end up quitting, when we emerge from that bender, that spree, we're filled with guilt, remorse, resentment, self-pity, and fear. You know, we feel guilty because we got so drunk and threw up on the bar floor. We're remorseful. We, used to, we, we didn't mean to do it. We feel like we didn't mean to do it. We get resentments, which were anger. We're mad at ourselves. We're mad at other people. We so, feel self-pity because the guy threw us out at a bar. We wanted another drink. And we're afraid that, oh, my God, when I get home, I'm going to get in trouble. You know, and so all these Character defects that we recognize as character defects in our program of Alcoholics Anonymous, all these character defects show up and we become restless, irritable, and discontented. Now, if we're of the addict in, in caught in this addictive cycle here, we will just, instead of not drinking, we will just continue with our addiction process, have another drink. And go around in this circle all over again. And we'll go around and around and around. Until one day we decide, hold it. I've had enough. 
I'm going to quit drinking. So we stop drinking. We make it a day or two. When we make it a day or two, we find ourselves in this emotional barometer. And for the first day or two, we're good. We fight it off. We won't drink. We refuse to drink. And it's not necessary for us to drink because we so want to quit that our willpower stops us from drinking. A couple more days pass. We're doing good. And our willpower stops us again. Then we really want to drink. You know, we're fighting it. We're really resisting. We're having a tough day but still not bad enough to drink. So we still have willpower enough to keep us away from the drink. But one day, sooner or later, we're going to get mad enough, sad enough, glad enough, angry enough, whatever. We're going to get there to where our willpower is insufficient to stop us from having a drink and we have another drink. Now, the guy with the strawberries won't ever get to this point where he has to have another strawberry. You know, the person who drinks milk will, can still have a choice not to drink not to drink milk. But with us alcoholics, the people that are the one out of 10, we're going to have to drink again. And we drink and then we enter the cycle and we go through that cycle all over again. So the guy that's not an alcoholic has a simple path, no damage, no problems. The alcoholic with the with the uh, allergy goes around and around and around in a cycle of self-destruction. And every one of those sprees, he emerges with more restlessness, more irritability, more discontentment. He has more guilt, remorse, resentment, self-pity and fear and continues on the addictive process. And we have brief periods of recovery when we fight it off for a few days, but then we go back to drinking. So what is the solution? Well, it doesn't have much about the solution on this page. It only mentions it one little time right here. It just says there's a solution. So there is a solution. But what is it? See, this is all about our physical state of mind and then our emotional state of mind. So this is the mental part. We can't stay away from the allergy that kicks our butt every time we we break that allergy. Every time we choose to have a drink, it kicks our ass, but we do it anyway. People that eat shellfish, that are allergic to shellfish, don't eat lobsters. People that are allergic to peanuts just will not eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They won't do it. They refuse to do it. And the people that have lactose intolerance or strawberry addiction... You know, they can make a choice because they're not going to die from it. They can make a choice if they're willing to be a little uncomfortable for a day. That's fine. But they never develop a craving where they say, I don't care if I'm sick. I need a strawberry. Nobody ever says they need a bowl of ice cream. Nobody ever says I need a peanut. Nobody ever says I need a lobster. People that have those allergies don't crave them. We have that craving from our alcohol and we can't stop. So what's our, what do we do about that? What's our solution? Well, believe it or not, there is a solution. Um, oh, one second. There is a solution. Here's our solution. Okay. Um, we're new and we decide we're going to quit drinking. Okay. We come into an AA room and we, we have the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The fellowship helps us out. Okay, so we're the new member and we're right in here. If you're one of these guys, get right here in the middle. When we do our chips, we say it's rough on the outside, smooth in the middle. So get in the middle. In the middle, you'll have old members come up to you and tell you how glad they are to see you. Old members will tell you that they're glad that you're here and they'll make you feel at home. Some of the old members support you through hope. They give you hope. They keep telling you, don't worry about it. You'll make it. We'll make it through this. Another old member comes up and gives you a ride to a meeting if you need it. Another old member tells you of the strength that you can gain from staying sober and staying in this program. So they give you strength. More old members supporting you. 
supporting you just through kindness and love. And then we have another old member who gives you his experience. So he tells you, he listens to some of your stories, he tells you of his stories, and he tells you how he made it through those rough days that you're that you're feeling. And that's the fellowship of those who suffer the same problem. So you're not listening to somebody who, who doesn't have the allergy to alcohol. You're not listening to somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about. You're listening to people that have the exact same problem you have. And they've all been in that place where they cannot stop drinking. And they want they wanted to quit and they came into AA and the older members, the people that were here before them, helped them out and allowed them to go follow a path that starts with coming to believe, coming to believe in something, to be willing to do whatever it takes to keep from going through that cycle of self-destruction again. And then they get you to a point where you want to do some work. You want to investigate what helped them. I want what he has. Let me find out how to get what he has. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on page 25, it tells you that you're going to be given a simple kit of spiritual tools to use. And all you have to do is pick those tools up and start using them. And what are those tools? Well, here they are. They're the 12 steps. And you just go through your steps one at a time, straight through your steps. You do all your steps and you work hard to get those steps done. And those are the principles that are going to save your life. Those are the principles that you learn to, pa to, to practice every day. And they're just a simple kit of tools. And now you come out of those 12 steps with your whole idea towards life revolutionized into something different. You see a much better life ahead. You have a better uh, a feeling towards your fellows and towards God's universe. And you come to believe in a power greater than yourself and let that power help you. Turn your will and your life over to that power. And as you do that, you start helping other newcomers. You greet some newcomers. You make them feel good. You may sponsor one or two. And you keep giving. Now you're giving away what you want, what you've learned through those 12 steps. And now it changes. And you have a personality change. Over here, you don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. And you're counting on these old people to help you out, the older members to help you out. And so you're counting on them. And you're taking from them everything they have to offer you. And you take that journey. Now you're giving that away. And it's a personality change that is sufficient for you to recover from alcoholism. And that's what the 12 steps will do for you. And how does that work? Fellowship supports you in the beginning. And then by going through what they go through and by using the simple kit of spiritual tools, you have a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening. And that changes you, okay? And that makes you become, um, you know, a person who can recover from alcoholism. And, you know, that's an important thing is to recognize what the disease is and why we get in the position we have. When I was sitting there in those bars, I didn't realize that I had an allergy. Nobody ever told me I had an allergy. I thought I was an, a drunk who wanted to drink more. I thought I was doing it because I wanted to. I didn't know I was doing it because I had to. I didn't know I was drinking because I had no choice, you know, and I didn't know a way out of the loop. I couldn't get out of that circle. You know, it was a merry-go-round that was moving too fast and I couldn't jump off the merry-go-round. So I had to stay on that merry-go-round. So it was quite a, it was quite a ride. It, it was a big ride. And then I found AA. Once I found AA, it was all you people that told me about the allergy. Then I understood it. And you told me about the allergy and that, that there was a way out. I, you know, I could, I could do something about it. I had the tools to do it. I could, I, you gave me a big book that contained 12 principles. And if I did those 12 principles, I got better. And I didn't drink. And I didn't want to drink. You know, and I had a way and I had tools to use to keep from going and having a drink again. 
And I have to develop that and develop those tools and use those tools every day. Carpenter can't take his tools to work on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and expect to get any work done on Tuesday and Thursday. He's got to have his tools with him every day that he goes to work. So the 12 steps have to appear in my life every day. They have to be a part of my life. I get up in the morning and start using the tools. And I use them all day long until I go to bed at night. You know, and that keeps me in remission. There is no cure for alcoholism. Every single person, whether you've been here for 90 days or 90 years, you're all, you're, we're all alcoholics and we're always going to be alcoholics and there is no cure for alcoholism. However, there is a treatment. The treatment is the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So that's where the solution is. If you found this program and go through it, so suppose we get sober and we stay sober for six months. And we say, I got it. You know, this is good. I'm sober. I feel good. I don't have a craving to drink. So I'm going to not go to the meeting tonight. You know, I'm not going to call my sponsor tomorrow. I'm just going to chill out because I'm good. I'm not going to drink. I'm good. I also understand what drinking is all about. I understand I have an allergy to it, but, you know, I can beat that. You know, after about nine months of this, you might even think, hey, you know, I think I got this under control. I think if I go out now and have a beer, I'm only going to have one. I can stop. I'm, it's not going to bother me. I can have one beer, maybe even two. Hell, some nights I might have three. And you go out, and that first night you try that one beer. And when you're drinking your 20th beer that night, you pound on the bar and say, what the hell did I do? And you can't understand how you got right back into it. But that's the nature of the allergy. You can't have one. The only way to ensure that you're not going to get drunk is to is 100% complete abstinence for, from drinking. And this is what the doctor did. This is what Dr. Silkworth did was talk to so many people that drank. He found out that it was the the, that one in 10 alcoholic that just could not control his drinking ever under any circumstances, no matter how long he went sober, no matter what his willpower was, no matter what his determination was, if he drank one drink, he was going to get drunk because you can't beat the allergy. You have the allergy. So the solution has nothing to do with drinking. Once you take that first drink, until you come out of that spree, which could be a day, two days, three days, a month, be, until you come out of there, nobody in Alcoholics Anonymous can help you. You know, we might be able to drag you into a detox center and let them help you out, but we can't help you find a solution when you're in that state of mind. And when you're, when you're drunk like that, you won't listen. You'll be constantly thinking of wanting another drink. When Eddie Thatcher went to tell Bill, first time he went to talk to Bill and said, Bill, I've got a solution. I found religion. Bill had a bottle of whiskey sitting on the, on the table and he just sat there and drank. And he even said in his own mind, oh, this boy's found religion. He, I'm going to let him preach to me as long as he wants to. I got enough whiskey to outlast him. And he just sat there and drank the whole time, you know. And here's Abby trying to help him get sober, but Bill is drinking. You can't help a guy that's drinking. So when Bill got drunk enough, Abby took him and put him in the hospital. And he was in there for three weeks. And it took him three weeks to sober up. And then Abby could go talk to him. And when Abby talked to him then, Bill was feeling the guilt and the remorse and the shame and all those things. He was irritable, discontented. He was all those things. And then he listened, you know, and he he was an agnostic. He didn't want to hear about God. He didn't want to hear about religion. The thing is, the solution to alcoholism is a relationship with a power greater than yourself, whatever you want to call it. But it's a it's that relationship with that higher power. 
I call it God. You can call it anything you want. But that relationship is the only thing that can get me to a point where I can resist having that first drink and not starting that cycle of self-destruction again. Only my belief and dependence and reliance on that power greater than myself can do it. It didn't turn me into a religious guy because I'm not religious. I just know that there's a power out there that's bigger than me, and that power has an effect in my life, and that power can help me do things that I can't do for myself. You know, sometimes it's a big white light experience like Bill had. Bill sat up in bed and said, who am I to say there is no God? And he came to believe in God right there in the hospital bed, fell out of bed on his knees and prayed to that God, which is something he, he didn't do before. So it came as a big sudden shock to him. Other people, it takes a long time. They have to think about it. They have to talk about it. They have to figure it. They have, you know, and then they want proof and they want to see results. They want to see evidence of a higher power. And stick around long enough, you will see some evidence of a power greater than yourself. You will see things change in your life. And it might not be a white light experience, but it will be a spiritual experience of the educational type, which we'll read when we start reading the book. You know, so this is the nature of our disease. Our disease is a two pronged disease. It's an allergy to, in our body, an actual chemical imbalance, a, a lack of the ability to digest alcohol. And because we can't digest it fast enough, it makes us want more because of the acetone. So it's the simple problem of having too much acetone in our body and we want to drink more. It causes a phenomenon of craving. But it's really when we're coming out of that spree and we look back and see how miserable we were from doing all that drinking and wondering why we did it, that's when we can be reached and that's when we should reach out for a solution to this. Because if we don't find a solution by the time we have our next drink, we're just going to be right back in the same hole again. So there's a window of opportunity from the end of, and that's what Bill tells us in, in Bill's story. From the end of a spree, we have the clock starts ticking. We can talk to the guy once he stopped drinking and sobered up enough. We can talk to that guy. And if we can save him, if we can convince him at that point that he's powerless over alcohol, that there's a power greater than himself that can solve the problem. And that if he can turn his will and his life over to that care of, to the care of that God, he will recover from alcoholism. We've got a short window there to tell him that. And if we can convince him before he takes his next drink, he may not take his next drink. We may have just saved the guy's life because if, we, if he takes another drink, who knows? You know, a lot. We, everybody in this room knows somebody that died from drinking. So they went out one day to have a drink. They didn't know that morning that that drink they were going to have that day was going to be the drink that killed them. They didn't know that. We don't know that. We don't know what day it's going to be that our friend who had been trying to get into the program, we don't know what day is going to be the day that he goes out and has that drink and drives his car into a pole or just dies from the drink or gets hospitalized because his liver shuts down. You know, you don't know when they're going to be in the hospital forever because they got a wet brain because they drank so damn much uh, alcohol that now their brain is just wet. And there's nothing they can do about it. There's no coming back from this. You know, we don't know when that's going to be. So, you know, our object is to when we have people that are coming off a spree or people that are trying to get sober, that whatever reason got them in that front door, we got to stick with them then, get the message to them, get them to understand that they have this disease and that there is a solution, but it's not a normal solution. No other disease tells you you got to believe in God to get well. This is the only disease that requires that. You know? Believing in God can help you heal, but this is the only one that, you know, this is the only way we know of to get sober and stay sober is by believing in a power greater than yourself that can restore you to sanity. 
So we're going to start that next week in the doctor's opinion. Let him explain it to us. Let Bill explain it to us in Bill's story. And we'll learn a lot about it. And then we'll learn about there is a solution in the next chapter. And then more about alcoholism, we agnostics, and on through the big book where we'll learn all the tools that we have to use at our disposal for free to get ourselves sober, stay sober, and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. Thank you very much. I look forward to next week.